It's uh, great to uh, talk to you guys about one of the most important technologies that our company works on. Uh, Curriculum Net is our, our focus in the field of weekly supervised learning. And this, uh, my morning session I described at a high level why weekly supervised learning is really relevant uh, to making practical uh, applications in computer vision. And I'll explain a bit more about that as I proceed. Um, so I'll be referring back to material that's published in a very recent conference in computer vision, the ECCV conference, the European Conference on Computer Vision, just about two or three months ago in, in Munich. Um, and so everything I'm presenting, there's a paper that you could get on archive, there's code you can get from GitHub, and there's models you can download as well. So everything has uh, references that you can look up for more details. And uh, Let's get started. So we first started uh, on the problem of weekly supervised learning pretty early on because we, we want to have a great AI company. And to do that, we need to be practical. And we found out that um, if you try to build an ImageNet data set for every problem you work on, it's just not scalable. Um, so the ImageNet data set is very famous, of course, because it helped us practice our computer vision algorithms on in deep learning, and we found out that deep learning works really well. Of course, it was a benchmark that had traditional computer vision as well, um, and we saw the difference of, uh, of deep learning around 2012. Um, but the thing is that the ImageNet data set is really well designed. I mean, yes, there are some flaws to it, but relatively speaking, it helps your algorithms really shine. Um, and it's something you don't really really worry about when you're working with that data set. Your algorithms are going to be um, you know, just really focused on improving performance, not really caring about the data quality itself. Uh, so we can think of ImageNet you know, in some way as the Olympic Games of, of computer vision and AI. Um, you know, it's, the, it's the typical competition that I'm sure everyone in this room knows. It's a thousand categories, airplanes and dogs and cats. And you know, it's it's often referenced in the top computer vision conferences, such as CVPR, ICCV, ECCV. Um, and you know, since 2009, when it started, to 2017, when it was essentially retired, it was really a key factor in, you can call it the AI revolution. Um, but it's retired now. I mean, it's saturated. The, the performance on ImageNet is now uh, beyond human level performance. And simply, it's, I think we've gone too far. So, no longer is it, is it a competition that people you know, really um, participate so much in. Uh, there are, are now successors. And one of the successors to ImageNet is Web Vision. Web Vision was also created by uh, Fei-Fei Li from, from Stanford, and actually at, when she was actually at Google at the time. Now she's back at Stanford. Um, and the Web Vision challenge is something I'm going to discuss in just a bit. But it was first um, introduced in CVPR 17. Um, by Google, CMU, and ETH Zurich. Uh, and it, the interesting thing about the Web Vision Challenge is exactly the same 1,000 objects, uh, except one key twist. No additional human annotation. So you compare it to the ImageNet, which is really well curated, and Web Vision, which is just a nightmare to work with if you're just going to apply your uh, regular old algorithms uh, that you, you do for ImageNet. And why we care about this data set is because it's really close to industry, real world applications. And so these were the, uh, the organizers, again, folks from uh, CMU, ETH, uh, Zurich, and, uh, and Google. So I'm going to walk through the Web Vision Challenge and then d discuss our algorithms and our approach to, uh, to getting a high score. In fact, we got the first place in the uh, Web Vision Challenge uh, in, in uh, CVPR. And um, the interesting thing is that the techniques we, we, we came up with actually took us a, quite a while to come up with. But we were able to demonstrate in this competition really high performance, uh, actually quite a wide margin. So that, in fact, the difference between the first place and the second place is nearly 50% relative error rate. So there's something quite significant what, with what we did. But in fact, our technique is rather simple. And it's, a, it's such a simple technique that I think everyone in this room 
who works with uh, deep learning can actually start applying pretty quickly. So let's examine some of this uh, data set difference between uh, Web Vision and ImageNet. So with the Web Vision data set, we've got two major data sources, Google image search labeled by queries, and Flickr images labeled by um, captions. So weekly supervised learning, there's still labels. And yeah, the labels actually did come about from human beings. Uh, it's not unsupervised learning. But so what? That's practical. That's the real world. Like if you're trying to, for example, train um, a model for retail and you're going to use eBay as a data source, it has a billion SKUs, there is, of course, metadata written by the auctioneer. So weekly supervised learning is practical because there's already labels. It's just the issue is, can we work with these noisy labels? And so this data set, we've got um, the same 1,000 categories, uh, two, nearly 2.5 two million training images, and uh, 50,000 test images and validation images. So this is just a side by side, so you can see the difference. Um, what is different here? So ImageNet, the key difference, of course, is that it was heavily curated by people. And let me give you some numbers to make it really clear why it's not scalable. ImageNet is about, in fact, the whole data set is about 14 million images, but the challenge was about 1 in 1.2 million. ImageNet took two years and nearly 50,000 people to label. That's not something you know, very practical if you're going to work with uh, build data sets like that. So instead of waiting two years to solve a problem, what if you can just start solving it right away. And that's what weekly supervised learning um, offers us, in fact. And so um, the Web Vision Challenge does have less, um, less uh, tasks than the ImageNet Challenge. But overall, it's the same concept, except it's noisy, random data from the web. And when I say noisy, I'll be very specific on what that means in just a bit. So again. The ImageNet challenge has reached some sort of saturation in 2017. It's only a 2.2% error, and human performance is about 5% error. Um, can we train CNNs, convolutional neural nets, without additional human labeling? That's what we are you know, bringing over to uh, weekly supervised learning as, as the challenge. Um, can we develop new approaches working on large-scale data in real-world scenarios? That's, that's what's at hand here. Uh, the data, the model, the architecture, the loss, the training strategy, these are all really important. Um, and I'm going to really zone in on the training strategy as, as a key point. Um, and we're going to train CNNs from web images, which are really common to many tasks in industry. So let's talk about how to, how to train a high-performance uh, CNN. What's, you know, what are all the pieces of the pie to make it? What, what factors are really influential? Um, so first, when you train a, a neural net, it's going to require data. Um, the data is, in fact, I would argue the data is the most important um, element uh, to, uh, you know, to high-performance deep learning uh, networks. And so you can take a large database, for example, ImageNet or WebVision. Now, the second thing you're going to want to work on, of course, is the network structure. So are you, what, what architecture are you going to choose? AlexNet, GoogleNet, VGGNet, ResNet, DenseNet, and so on. Um, we all know the performance of the network structures are different at different depths. Um, and then the third part is the loss equation, the loss function. So these three parts are, indens, you know, are just incredibly, of course, important for training a deep, deep model. But what role do they play in the process? So the first, of course, is the data is the resources for the model training. Um, the network structure determines and, you know, how we comp complete and implement a task, such as how to extract features, um, and which is you know, the image in, in feature space. The, lo the loss function is uh, to determine what tasks, actually, the, the network does, and really what to do, such as classification, detection, segmentation. Uh, they're all implemented by different loss functions. So what part of the final model performance is, you know, is it's all reflected in? The, 
The neural network is actually really a feature extraction process. Um, so as long as the feature extraction is, is good, the remaining tasks are relatively simple. The quality of the uh, decision in, you know, is the middle. It's, it's, it's really, uh, focus, once you have really good features, the, the process is actually, uh, you know, for the task is actually much more straightforward. Um, so we talk a lot about these three things, but we talk less about learning strategy. And that's what this talk is all about. You know, learning strategy hasn't, hasn't been really in vogue in research uh, for a while until recently. And that's really where weekly supervised comes into play. If we're just talking about supervised learning, which is ba basically what everyone uses, um, we find that supervised learning um, is somewhat naive in, in its uh, training strategy and its learning strategy. Because in supervised learning, you're essentially teaching the model in a way that the model has to trust you a lot, right? You're, you're going to be providing uh, data that uh, the model is, is going to have to believe. And you're going to provide it in random order and not really consider um, the learning uh, pathway for, for the model. And we found that if you really do put effort into learning strategy, you can develop much more robust models. And I'll, I'll dive into more of what, I'm, what I mean by that. Let's look at the challenge. What is the problem and what's so interesting about uh, weekly supervised learning and web vision, it's this. This is a real mess. Uh, this is actually the training set, the, the data set that's provided in web vision. And this is um, a chart to demonstrate the uh, imbalance, the data imbalance. You can see that some, so on the bottom you can see the number of categories. It's a thousand categories. And some categories at the fat part of the curve are really just spiking on the number of, cat of, the number of samples which, of course, as you know, is going to drastically bias the model if you just take all that data and, and start training a model. Um, and so normally, when, when we're thinking about a data set, we want to curate it, we want to balance, and we want to make sure that the um, categories are distributed evenly um, so we don't bias towards any one or the other category. And so here, at the long tail of the curve, we, we significantly drop down. And so if you just apply supervised learning techniques to a data set like this, you know, the result is not going to look really pretty at all. Um, and so we attack this problem, and we're able to still train a high-performance model. And I'll show you how we did it. So just so you guys see here, um, the, the uh, purple area is the entire Web Vision set. And again, there's two, um, there's two uh, components of Web Vision, which is Flickr and Google. And we see a lot of variance there. And then very interesting is this um, cyan color here, which is it's actually ImageNet. And you can see how flat it is, how even it is, right? So that's actually the data set that everyone works with. And the data set behind it, again, is a real, real trouble to work with. But this trouble is the real world. This is if, you know, our company is dealing with enterprises. And when we get a problem from a big customer, that's the kind of data set we're going to work with. And so we need a technique to solve it. And to, to make it more visceral, you can see the, uh, some examples here. So the first one is, at the top, it's, uh, it's tench, which apparently is a kind of fish. And you can see that the, the examples that were given, yes, yeah, some of them contain a fish, and some of them contain maybe a guy named tench. I'm not sure. Um, why there's uh, random images there. Um, and then there's this uh, terrapin, which a, is a turtle. And the other one is a turtle as well. And you can see the diversity of data. I think at the end, maybe it's turtle soup. Um, I, some images, I have no idea. There's a moon. Why is there a moon? I have no idea. Who knows? That's the kind of data set that you're dealing with in the real world. Um, you'll get a lot of images that are the same. Um, but then there's going to be a, a drop off on, on relevance. So let's be practical in how to handle that. And, and there's some more examples here of, of labeling noise. Um, so we can see that uh, for, for example, the top box, we can maybe see there's a boxer at, at some point. Um, so there's just a lot of noise here. And on the left side, if you group together the common parts of that class, you'll, you will get a sense of the, uh, you know, maybe the baseline. And then you can build on top of it. For example, on bananas, maybe there's like a banana um, you know, drink there. I'm not sure what the dog is doing there, but oh yeah, I see at the bottom it says banana. The dog's name is apparently banana. 
Um, but anyway, this is, this is a real world data set. So uh, what we're up against here is to directly learn from noisy labels. And noisy here means sometimes incorrect, sometimes skewed uh, to other, other uh, categories and, and whatnot. Uh, so we're dealing with label cleansing methods. And uh, there, are, there are other methods to deal with this. So you know semi-supervised learning, uh, unsupervised learning. And again, the road less traveled is weekly supervised learning. Semi-supervised learning, you may think, is, is a good way to solve this. Um, so what is this in a nutshell is you, you take a subset of the data, um, and it's representative of the entire data, and then you use that to inform you know, the rest. Uh, but semi-supervised learning has a big problem. The problem is you still need to carefully curate that subset of data. It sounds not such a big problem, right? You're like, well, I'll just collect some, sub, some subset, and that should be that should be fine. But it turns out that if you really try to implement semi-supervised learning, you're going to find out that how, choosing that small subset is very difficult um, because you have to be very sensitive to the entire class that you're working with, and you can't bias towards any particular category. So that's, that's still the weakness of semi-supervised learning is still the data management. And um, maybe this is a point I should also raise generally is that where we are in computer vision is I think now with weekly supervised learning, we're getting to the, um, a really advanced stage. So the first part of computer vision, I feel, is traditional computer vision, where the complexity is programming logic, essentially. And then the first era of computer vision with deep learning, the complexity is in data management. And now, with weekly supervised learning and other techniques, we're solving that with better algorithms. So let's dive into some more details here. And, and there are some uh, recent, um, recent work in, in the field uh, that you guys can check some of our related work in our paper. So our method is curriculum learning. So within weekly supervised learning, our approach is curriculum learning. And curriculum learning is very intuitive. It's, uh, first of all, where we started, you know, where did we base this method on is, um, in 2009, there was actually a, pap a paper by uh, Joshua uh, Beggio, and he actually and his team introduced weekly supervised learning um, technique of curriculum learning uh, for um, for a, a more um, you know simple case that didn't get that much attention. Like at total, it was just a few hundred uh, citations, and again, it was back in 2009. Uh, we we found the paper and we, we started building on top of it. Um, and we can see what's the basic concept here. Uh, it's to train CNNs on tasks with increasing difficulty. Um, you want to use samples with increasing complexity. And the intuition behind it is something like when you're learning as a child. You know, as a young child, you're not going to be learning advanced calculus or something like that. You're going to be learning your ABCs and 123s. And so as a child, you build up your base knowledge. And then on top of it, you build up more complex concepts. And as you, you know, uh, get older, you get more mature, you're able to handle noise better. You know, uh, if you see something that's a, a bit you know, unbelievable, maybe you're going to start to doubt it, or you're going to extract out what you feel is, is real in that information. But as a child, you're going to be very naive, and you're going to just accept what you're given and build up that foundation. And so that's essentially the um, intuition behind curriculum learning. What if we take that concept to the machine and we actually train models like that, where we go in levels of, uh, you know, increasing levels of complexity? And so, um, yeah, when you train large-scale data, you can let the model train on the simple samples first and then gradually increase uh, the performance of the model by increasing the difficulty and complexity of the samples. And we found something really surprising. And when you check our paper, you can, you can take a look at this. We found that at some level, if you add noise, noisy data, it's actually a good thing. You know, if you start, so in other words, we're always afraid of noise in the data set. We want to make a clean data set as possible. And we, but we have a dial, essentially, where we can dial up and dial down noise. And in the last stage of our process, uh, we actually do allow some noise in. And it turns out the model um, actually has higher performance. And we believe that actually this bit of noise, in fact, acts as somewhat of a regularization effect. 
um, when you sprinkle in some noise. And maybe you can think of it as intuitively as, as yourselves when you're learning. Um, when you, know, you want to basically exit your comfort zone at some point and be exposed to the complexities of the real world and be challenged. Uh, maybe that's a, a bit of the intuition behind this concept where we actually challenge the network a bit more and it, it can actually generalize better when we challenge it with, uh, with noisier data. But not too noisy. It has to be just a certain amount at, at a certain time. And I'll explain a bit more of that. So the steps to curriculum learning are straightforward. Um, so the first step, split the data set or split the learning problem into a number of subtasks. These subtasks are ordered by difficulty. And you can think of them almost as um, grades in, in grade school or lessons, something like that. And you decide a task transformation threshold where essentially, how do you know you graduate from you know, grade seven to grade eight type of thing? Uh, and then you find an optimized path that leads to a fast convergence and better generalization. And again, we, we hold to this simple principle. Proceed to harder tasks or harder grades or challenges once the easier ones have been handled or learned. So that's the essential idea. And now I will describe to you our framework. So we use the idea of curriculum learning. And this picture is uh, dividing into a number of training subsets of, difficult, of, of different difficulty uh, to complete the multi-step iterative uh, training of the whole model. Um, the specific method is as follows. So first, on the left side, we train a baseline model with all of the training images. And we use this baseline model to propose feature vectors for each image in the training set and use these features to define the difficulty of the images in each class. Um, and I'll explain more how that works. The entire training da data set is then divided into subsets of, difficult, of different levels of difficulty. That's the second phase of this uh, process. And that we call curriculum design. And then the final uh, stage is, um, we call it curriculum learning. It's the multi-step iterative training of the model. It's completed through the design of the curriculum and the original learning of the, of the curriculum. And um, I'll, I'll explain that also a little bit later. And how do we, how do we decide these subsets? How do we then engage in the training and produce the final model? But this is sort of the 30,000 feet view of, uh, of what's going on. And you'll notice, I guess, some key difference to uh, the uh, you know, straightforward training of models was the fact that we do come up with these grades. And we build on top of these uh, levels of complexity. So subset one is so-called easier. Subset two is harder, and subset N is, is actually most difficult. And how we combine those, um, those, those data sets, those subsets of data, into a learning process, uh, that's actually the, the magic behind it. And I'll dive into more of that. OK. Yeah. Interesting question. Um, actually, every subset contains every class. Yeah, and so it's like, if you think of it, the analogy would be, OK, the advanced version of you know, frog, right? And so uh, how, how does that look? Or what's the intuition behind that? OK, so the simple version of a frog is just a frog with a white background, right? And, or just really straightforward. It's pretty obvious that it's a frog. But as you get in orders of complexity, like the medium, medium level is maybe the frog leaping into the air or um, splashing to water, or maybe one just in the water with just its eyes just right above the water. Right? So these are just levels within um, each subset for every single category. And, and so yeah, basically our approach, our you know, contribution is that we came up with a clustering method. Um, this is actually helps us decide the, the categories. And it's a density distance uh, or uh, density-based clustering method. And um, we, we tried a lot of different methods to, uh, to cluster and, in an unsupervised way. And we found out that density clustering is, the, is actually the best way um, to, uh, to bring 
these, uh, these subsets into, um, into these lessons. And I'll explain why that's the case. It's because we, our intuition is that, um, and there is an assumption here, but it turns out from our experiments the assumption is, seems to be holding. It's that um, the easier data, the simpler data actually is, uh, there's actually a similarity in feature space to each of these, um, these data points. So we'll see a clustering of the simple stuff. You know, the, uh, the obvious uh, examples will actually be clustered together um, and we find that the density of that cluster will fall into the bucket of easier, medium, and hard based on how we observe the density. And I'll, I'll show you what that looks like here. So these are examples of categories after the design of the, uh, of the curriculum. It can be seen that the first cluster here, subset one, uh, is a relatively clean data. And the data of the last cluster is relatively random. And so we generate these three clusters. So for the, for the purpose of our, our paper, we actually just use three classes or three, um, three subsets. But you can imagine this distributing to uh, n. And the code we released on GitHub, we do allow you to set that parameter to, uh, to change uh, for your experimentation. So we generate three clusters in each category, and we simply use the images within each cluster as a data subset. Each cluster has a density value measuring the data distribution within it and the relationship between different clusters. And this provides a natural way uh, to define the complexity of the subsets given a simple rule for designing a learning curriculum. A subset with a high density value means that all images are close to each other in feature space, as I just mentioned, and suggesting that these images have a strong similarity. We define the subset as a clean one by assuming most of the labels are correct. The subset with a small density value means that the images have a large diversity in visual appearance, which may include more irrelevant images with incorrect labels. Uh, this subset is considered noisy data. And therefore, we generate a number of subsets in each category, arranged from clean, noisy, to highly noisy, which are ordered by increasing complexity. Each category has the same number of subsets, and we combine them all over all categories, which form our final learning curriculum that implements the training sequentially on clean, noisy, and highly noisy subsets. And we show that the distribution of these three subsets um, you know, in these categories from the Web Vision data set are, um, you know, are, are actually uh, a viable way to score very highly on that challenge. And so um, the images from the clean subset have a very close visual appearance, while the highly noisy ones um, contain random images and so on. So, below, so this is actually after we apply our, uh, our clustering, we find that we get things like this, where subset one for, for Tench is actually turns out to, uh, to follow this uh, fish. And uh, in a later subset, we actually get these uh, photos of a, of a person apparently named Tench. And uh, so on for the turtle case as well. Yeah. If you have like offline pictures in class center, probably you do. The guy named Sancho in class center. So do you want to label that guy as Tench? So is it correct labeling somehow, or is it just outlier? And do you have something in, in the testing instance like it's off class? Yeah. So it turns out that there are different um, senses of a word. You know, in other words, that. A one word can actually mean different things. It is entirely correct that a single word could mean a, a person main, named Tench. So if you test the model on this word, you, you do want to get the correct classification if you provide this person or you provide the fish. So for the purpose, so this is not multi-label classification. In, in fact, that would be more appropriate if we were doing a multi-label task. But for this single task, um, it's okay to have all of these categories um, built into one, one class. And so when you're finally testing it later, you do want to get a higher result, a high, you know, high performance result if you test the model with uh, a person named Tench. Uh, but I would say that if I was designing this as a real um, task for an enterprise customer, I would not choose this as a classification work. I would probably choose this as multi-label classification. Um, so, but yeah, for the purposes of the test, the challenge from WebVision, 
Um, this actually works just fine. Yeah. Uh, in passing time, if you put that picture of your guy as a human plus, would you say the yeah, are crucifying correctly, or would you say if you put that picture in the hand class? Yeah, it would. Say? So that's where it gets murky, because again, it's it, you know it's supposed to be um, a single category, uh, but if we were tested on it, maybe there's going to be some overlap. Person would probably come up high, but maybe tension would come up second. And maybe in the, so normally when we're tested on, on the evaluation, it's usually top five results. And so there is some level of ambiguity that's okay for, for this type of test. But again, I would say that it would be better to distribute them in separate classes if we were designing that, that, ex, that test. But for the purposes of, of, uh, of a curriculum design, um, I think you can get a sense of how this model is built, but you can apply these concepts to other tasks as well. So, so in this um, table or this diagram, I want to just explain that we use different training weights, actually, with samples from different subsets when they're merged. We set the most clean samples with a weight of 1 and noisy samples with weights of uh, 0.5 based on our experiments. And uh, this equation here is, uh, is really just trying to show that we've got um, different weights uh, as we're computing the, uh, the standard gradient for back propagation. Um, and I, I probably should detail how this actually works. So subset one with a weight of one, um, we're going to train a model from that. And that's the easy, easy category. But this is, a, this is actually the, the clever bit here, is that we're, we train that model, but we're going to do two special things on subset two. The first thing is we're going to actually combine the data sets, combine subset one and subset two, the images of those two subsets. We're going to make a new data set from those two, those, those two subsets. And then we're going to fine tune the first model with that new data set. And so it's, again, it's a, it, it, those two um, ovals represent a kind of a data collection and then a model training. And then that finally produces task number two. And then on subset three, it's the same bit. We're going to combine them all together again and then fine tune once again. And then we can approach task three and ultimately our final model. And so this is, this is actually the approach to... Uh, to uh, curriculum learning uh, or for curriculum net that turns out to get a really high score on, on web vision. So let me uh, describe a little bit more. So the learning process is performed um, you know, by the following, following the nature of the underlying data structure. That is, the designed curriculum is able to discover the underlying data structure based on visual appearance in an unsupervised manner. We design a learning strategy which relies on intuition. The tasks are ordered by increasing difficulty. And training is proceeded sequentially from easier to hard. We develop a multi-stage learning process that trains a standard neural network more efficiently with the enhanced capability uh, for handling massive noisy labels. Uh, training details um, are such that when a convolutional model is trained through these three stages by uh, continuously mixing training subsets, from the clean subset to the highly noisy one. Uh, we can first see a standard convolutional architecture. We can use one uh, such as Inception v2. Um, that's actually the one we use for our paper. The model is trained first by only using the clean data, where each category has uh, the images by a very close visual appearance. This allows the model to learn the basic but clear visual information for each category, um, and serving as the fundamental features for the following um, following process. Second, when the model trained in the first stage converges, we continue the learning process by adding the noisier data where images have more sig significant visual diversity, allowing the model to learn more meaningful and discriminative features from harder samples. Although the noisy data may include incorrect labels, it roughly preserves the main structure of the data and thus leads to a performance improvement. Uh, thirdly, the model is further trained by adding the highly noisy data in stage three, which contains a large number of visually irrelevant images with incorrect labels. Uh, the deep features learned by the following, you know, following the two, uh, first two-stage curriculum are able to capture the main underlying structure 
um, of the data. And we observed that the highly noisy data added in the last stage does not impact negatively to the learned data structure. By contrast, it improves the generalization capability of the model, which is actually the really surprising point to mention, and allows the model to avoid overfitting over the clean data by providing somewhat of a manner of regularization. A final model is ultimately obtained when the training converges into the last stage, where the three subsets are all combined. In addition, when samples from different subsets are combined in the second and third stages, uh, we set different loss weights to the training samples, uh, such as I mentioned, 1, 0.5, and 0.5 for the clean, noisy, and highly noisy. And those were just defined through experiments, which um, uh, actually offered us the, the uh, higher performance. And so to prove this to you in experiment, um, we have, we've trained a, a bunch of different models that we can compare. Um, so the first model, model A, is trained only in clean data, subset one. Uh, model B is actually trained across all the data, using all the data directly. Um, the third model, model C, is using the curriculum methods we introduced earlier. And in the last model, we used um, the, uh, the methods of curriculum learning uh, across you know, uh, the entire, uh, the entire um, uh, three levels that, that were mentioned before. So there's two subsets and then three subsets. So we can consider uh, A and B more of the baseline and C and D is actually the uh, curriculum model. So we want to determine should we use two levels or should we use three levels? And we can see how that works. Um, so I should talk about data balancing. Um, so by comparing with ImageNet, um, we, we actually came up with a selective data balance approach. So by comparing with ImageNet again, another challenge of the web vision data is that the training images in different categories are highly unbalanced. So for example, a large scale category can have over a thousand, oh sorry, over 10,000 images, while a small scale category can have just a few hundred. Um, CNN models directly trained with random sampling on such unbalanced classes will have a bias towards the large categories. So to alleviate this problem, we developed a two-level data balancing approach. Um, we use subset level balancing and category level balancing. And in the subset level balancing, training samples are selected in each mini batch as follows. So we have a 256, um, uh, 00, a 128, 128, and uh, 128, 64, 64 for stages one through three, respectively. Uh, for the category level balance in each mini batch, we first select, um, we, we first random select 256 um, in stage one or 128 in stage two and three categories from the 1,000 classes. And then we randomly select only one sample from each selected category. And notice that the category level balance is only implemented on the clean set, uh, the clean subset. The performance was dropped down when we applied it to the noisy or highly noisy subset. So that's why we chose uh, just the clean one. And because we randomly collect a single sample from each category in the category level balance, it's possible to obtain a single but completely irrelevant sample from the noisy or highly noisy subset, which would ne negatively affect uh, training. Um, and this is another thing we discovered that uh, there, so we, we focus on training strategy, but there was a bit of architecture here. When working with noisy data, we did observe uh, that if we introduce a multi-level convolutional kernels, that actually did improve the performance um, by 0.5, which is still pretty significant, and I think it's worth to mention here. Um, so we apply multi-scale convolutional kernels in the first convolutional layer uh, with three different kernel sizes, 5x5, 7x7, and 9x9. And then we concatenate those three convolutional maps to generate, uh, generated by the three types of filters, which form the final feature maps for the first convolutional layers. So the multi-scale filters enhance the low-level features in the first layer, um, again, leading to about 0.5% uh, performance improvement on the top five errors of the web vision data set. And so we're, our, th our thinking behind this is that it, um, this multi-level uh, convolutional kernel approach, is, uh, it does work better with uh, extremely noisy data. And so we, uh, we found that actually significant, well, somewhat significantly improves the uh, performance. Um, and so here we can just see how the uh, the, uh, the testing loss of the four different models with Inception V2, how it, how it, uh, how it goes here. And we can see that uh, model D, which is the one that contains the three subsets, um, you can see where, where we are here, um, and how model A is actually pretty, pretty far up on, on, on loss. So uh, we can have the, uh, the results here. 
of the different models. Again, model A um, is our clean. Model B is our uh, total subset, uh, total, total data set. A C is, is, is two level, and, uh, and D is actually three level um, subsets. And the, uh, the performance actually is pretty clear um, where we are in, in, uh, in that model D has, uh, has a higher top one and top five. And, and yeah, that was actually our experimental results. And then we did a analysis on categories, and we can see um, model, um, model B is just the, uh, again, the naive approach, so to speak, and, and model D is the three subsets. And we can see that uh, really across the board, uh, model D outperforms significantly on, on these different categories. So we improved um, 668 categories out of 1,000. Um, a few got slightly reduced, and, and, uh, and uh, less than that were unchanged. Um, so this was the, the challenge that we entered, uh, again, held by Google and uh, CVPR, uh, uh, and hosted at CVPR. I would like to show you that our, the, again, this is the same essential challenge as ImageNet, but with, uh, with noisy data. And human level performance is 95%, roughly, on, on top five. And on our best run, run number four, we have 94.78 which essentially achieves human level performance on noisy data, which is really helpful. Um, and and we, we can see that although our, our technique I just described, um, you can actually implement it. It's, it's rather straightforward. It actually has a very significant um, improvement on, uh, on everyone else. So this competition actually had over 100 companies and universities participate. And if you look at the um, error rate, the rel relative error rate, we actually have a significantly higher um, uh, performance over, over the other scores. Um, so we hope that this is a method that others can start to, adapt, uh, to adopt in, in their work, in your work. So, um, so that is actually uh, a photo of my co-founder receiving the first place award from Fei-Fei Li. So we're very honored. Okay, so in summary, uh, we want to, uh, what, what I went over was training high performance CNNs from large scale raw, noisy web images. And we want to handle label inconsistency and data unbalance or data imbalance. Um, with curriculum learning or curriculum net, we achieve better generalization capability. And we can improve you know, real world, uh, prove our products or, or your products with real world data crawled from the internet uh, with less human labeling or labels that are inconsistent. Um, and you can think of this technique not just useful for for uh, web, web data, you can think of this technique also for any type of noisy data. Um, as long as you have it in, in, a, in a large number, you can even apply this to areas such as medical images. Why medical? Um, the reason is that if you give two doctors the same medical record, you're probably going to get two slightly different results. If, if you ask them to do a very precise task, for example, like um, segmenting a lesion you know, in three dimensions in an MRI. Um, so you're not going to get always exactly the same thing. Doctors will have different opinions. And so if we can work with um, better techniques to generalize over noisy data, uh, that's going to ultimately give us higher performance. And so uh, that's the basic idea. Um, these are my team members that join me on the project. And again, uh, we have this. Everything I just said, if you want to go into more detail, if you want to look at the paper, uh, again, just recently published in ECCV. Uh, it's on archive. You can just search for curriculum net and you'll find it. And linked in the paper is our GitHub repo, which has code and models that you can download and you can play with and, and uh, recreate our, uh, our results. So with that, I want to say thank you very much. Uh, and if there's any questions, I can tackle those. And there you go. Thank you. Yes, sir. So the five runs from that competition, were those just random samples? Oh, uh, the five runs? Uh, yeah, so the five runs were actually um, trying out uh, different combinations of the number of subsets and, and some of the parameters. Uh, so the five runs that you're competing with, you compared against other competitors? Yes, yes. Even there, they were? Yeah, we, we tried. Random samples, okay. Oh, um, what do you mean random sample? Yeah, sure. Yeah. That short month. Yeah. 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 What is the difference between run one and run five? Good question. Um, 
we are allowed for this competition to submit five, you know, five results, oh, basically. Oh. And so we just tried slightly different variations. Yeah, yeah. So. So, so it's still a variation on your algorithm. And, uh, and was that on data not used at all during your training process? Was that a oh, yeah. There's a purely separate yeah, okay. yeah, testing set. And it's, it's, uh, it's very similar to, again, the uh, ImageNet competition. Uh, that you, you're given a data set you've never seen before, and then you apply, apply the results. Yeah, but you can see that even though there is some variance across all the runs, um, there's still, I think every single run almost, uh, yeah, I think every single run is, is still the highest. Even our worst try, um, our naive approach is more on run number one. It still outperforms, I think, every single one. Um, but normally, I think many of our um, you know, peers are, are also trying some other parameters to just to tweak it out and, and get the best score. Um, so that's it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I probably wouldn't cherry pick and say the highest number. I would just take the mean of a. Yeah, I, if, I think if you. Probably a random fluctuation instead of a fundamental one. Or yeah, I, one. I agree. I mean, you can, if, if you take the mean, it, it'll still be like 94. Yeah, no, yeah. That, that seems like the best case. Yeah, thank you. Yes, sir. As you said, it's quite surprising that uh, Subset 3 still improves their performance. Yes. And uh, you just also said that it's either regularization or like, maybe there is still some information of the, of the, the category in, left in Subset 3. So have you tried like, measuring the sample? Yeah, that's actually a really great question. In fact, I'd like to leave that open as a new research area for people to explore. We didn't have enough time to really dive into why. We didn't explore why it's actually happening, but we did observe the, the, the behavior that it, it is, in fact, occurring. Why does adding a subset three, which is highly noisy, why does it increase the performance? We didn't answer the why question. We speculate that it's a, some kind of regularization. So I, I would encourage you, if you're interested, to maybe look into that and, and let me know, too. Um, I'd, like, I'd like to learn more about that as well. Yeah. So when you say it's highly, highly noisy, yes. can you Else rather than uh, density in the clustering, or is it just that measure? Oh, yeah, it's just that measure. Yeah, thank you. So, and this is our office, by the way. So, right by the water, it's really nice. We're in Shenzhen. It's called the Greater Bay Area. Um, if you're interested, okay. Uh, it's actually Shenzhen, China, um, but they call it now the Greater Bay Area. So it's, uh, you know, uh, inspired by. And those mountains actually are Hong Kong, so very nice to easily come in. And okay. It must get pretty warm in the summer, though. Yes, it's it's pretty warm all the time. Yeah, it's like a tropical environment. So. And if anyone's ever interested to come by, you got an open door to, uh, to visit. So thank you. OK, thank you.